I need to make this interactive light panel for an event in one week. I do not have time to order boards and I need nine of them for it to work correctly. So I'm going to use my fiber laser to manufacture the PCBs and my pick and place to assemble them all on my workbench. Turn my bench into a fully fledged PCB production factory. If you're new here, a few years ago, I started a project around an open source pick and place machine, which automatically assembles circuit boards. And then I started a company around selling them. If you want to start the whole saga from the beginning, you can click here to catch up. This is the PCB that I need nine of. In a week, each one has a little reflective sensor and an LED. So when you tap on it, the sensor can detect it and it'll light up and react. Plus with all these ports around the edges, they can talk to other nodes. So when you tap one, it can send a signal and make all the other ones around it react as well. Thankfully, my fiber laser can make single-sided PCBs with a solder mask. I actually did a whole video about this. You can watch it here if you haven't seen it. And my Lumen PMP can very easily assemble components onto the PCB. So I'm going to turn my workbench into a factory and crank these things out as fast as possible. Okay, <laughs> I messed up bad. <laughs> My first board was beautiful. Even the the freaking cardstock stencil worked pretty well. A little too much pace, but it was fine, more or less. Parts go on beautifully on the Lumen, but I didn't check to see if FR1 has the same reflow capabilities as FR4. And of course it doesn't, because that would be too easy. So I got this. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> it got all bubbly, which is a real problem because I need to reflow with this profile for the solder paste that I'm using. Now, I have reflowed boards before with FR1 and this higher temp solder paste. Loctite GC10 is what we use, and it is the best paste ever. Loctite GC10 is the best solder paste, in my opinion. It is possible to do this by just being a little more gentle with it and either hitting it with a hot air gun or putting it on a little hot plate or something like that works a lot better. But just putting it into an oven and baking it for the full reflow profile, you're gonna get that. I've tried to program these boards for hours. I've tried reworking the connections, so I am gonna have to not use this whole panel that I made <laughs> because of this mistake and move on. I have already made another one because it's so easy to do. It's like actually so easy to just make one of these panels. So I'm just gonna try again and be more careful with my reflow, do it slower and by hand with a hot air gun. And in the future, the solve is to get a lower temp solder paste. I think that is the actual real solve here. I don't have any on hand and I literally need to make these boards today. But in the future, good quality FR1, single-sided, one ounce blanks, UV curable solder mask, low temp solder paste, and some cardstock sheet for the stencil and the Lumen PNP, you're a factory. You can just make boards. It's crazy, it's so cool. So I'm gonna give this another spin, put some paste on this, toss it in the Lumen, get the parts on and do a little bit more careful reflow. And hopefully we're gonna get some of these boards made. <laughs> I 
have an old PCB that I cut out of FR1 on my hot plate. I want to get it up as hot as I can without hurting the substrate, without hurting the FR1. Keep it just under where the FR1 can handle and then pop, hit it with a little bit of hot air, get the parts to reflow, get in and out really quickly. There's that little bit of solder paste that I used for a test. I put it on a ground pad so it's like theoretical worst case scenario, most heat wicking from the hot air blast location. It reflowed in maybe just a few seconds, which is fantastic. No damage to the FR1. I think this is what I'm gonna do for this board I just populated. And hopefully I don't break another one. Okay, I am back from the desert and I got it done in time. I was at a cyberpunk event called Neotropolis, which takes place in the Mojave Desert. Everyone dresses up all cyberpunk and brings all kinds of flashy stuff. It's super fun. And it was easily done by the time I had to leave for the event, which is crazy. I started this whole thing six days before I had to leave and I was done four days before I had to leave. Beginning to end, all fabrication. With a proper reflow technique for FR1, like not totally baking the heck out of it like I did before. The boards were totally okay. They worked beautifully. I got all the boards mounted up in this frame, wired them together, and they all took firmware, they all work. And then I printed this cover which has holes in it for the reflective sensors to shine through. And you can see I kind of had to offset all the boards so that the reflective sensors would be nice and centered when the cover's on it. So if you tap one of the sensors, it kicks off a little animation across every node. It's so cool. <laughs> and actually when you power it on for the first time, all the nodes boot up and calibrate their exposure level because I wanted them all to be pretty robust to a varying amount of light. The sensor here is just kicking out a little bit of IR light and looking to see how much reflects back. So if I point this at the sun, or also as I discovered the LiDAR sensor in my phone, it will also make it trigger. Modules that I'm working on. Oh my gosh, is it my Holy shit. It's my phone camera. Whoa, that's so cool. I wonder if I cover up the LiDAR module, does it stop? Yup. <laughs> Anyway, it's pretty cool. So how did it actually go trying to fabricate every aspect of this device before I went to the event? Honestly, exceptionally well. Like way better than I expected it to be. I think from the time that all the design source was done to the time that I had this wired up was 30 hours. And that includes an evening and a night's sleep. I think if I didn't mess up that first panel by reflowing it, I think I could have gotten this whole thing fabricated in one eight hour workday, which is insane that that is possible. And these are like pretty standard PCB requirements. These are TQFP microcontrollers with 0.5 millimeter pitch, all 0402 passives. And this is nine individual boards. It's not like this was a single Soik 8 and some 1206s. This is like standard part requirements for like an average board you might make. Also, this board did not need a second side. If you watched my previous video about making boards with a fiber laser, I was really hemming and hawing about trying to get a second side for these PCBs. When I was designing this, I ended up using a single zero ohm jumper to jump one trace over another. Using this jumper kind of gives you a free second side of copper, only for a tiny little bit. It's like two vias right next to each other, kind of. <laughs> I know that it's not gonna work for a fair number of designs, but if your thing is not terribly complex and you have enough board space, it works. It's like not a bad way to go about doing it. And I think it's kind of what I'm gonna focus on for when I wanna make boards that kind of need a second side on the fiber laser. I'm just gonna toss some jumpers in there and buy myself a couple vias for the cost of one component, one feeder slot, that's a pretty good trade. And I don't have to spend all that extra time making a second side, doing alignment, doing another solder mask. That's not bad. And although they don't cover every use case and they're not actually going to be representative of your final design, it's a great prototyping technique. I did consider adding connectors to all these different boards, but it would have taken forever to make all those little individual harnesses. And I knew I could do all the point to point wiring in like 20 minutes. And then of course the whole enclosure was printed and it was easy to just kick them off and have them run on a printer while the fiber laser was making all the PCBs. Honestly, the trickiest part of this whole thing was the stencil. The thing that ended up working the best for me was thick cardstock. Thank you to Harvey Mitchell who reached out with this suggestion. Greatly appreciate it. Just thick paper kind of worked the best. And I tried a lot of stuff. A lot of people recommend Mylar. Mylar did not work well for me at all. <laughs> I tried it on both the blue laser and the IR fiber laser inside my laser. And I could not either get it to cut cleanly or just do so without melting or scorching or burning and catching on fire. It was a mess. 
I'm pretty sure this works way better with CO2 lasers. Almost all of the examples and documentation that I've read about making SMT stencils with mylar or transparencies uses a CO2 stencil. Like Pololu has a service where you can go on and they'll just cut a quick stencil for you out of mylar. I'm almost positive they're using a CO2 laser. And then I tried metal. You figure if my fiber laser can cut metal, why wouldn't I do it exactly like I do with an SMT stencil that I'd buy for production? Well, <laughs> there's a couple of reasons. Mainly warping. Oh my God, what a pain in the butt. Look at this, completely unusable. I didn't even cut all the way through this and I just stopped the job because it was warping so much I knew I would never get a clean stencil sweep out of this. This one is actually quite a bit better, but it's still, you can see, I mean, the way it's kicking light, there's no way you're gonna get a nice, smooth, consistent solder paste deposition from a stencil like this. And it did cut all the way through, but it also still burned out all the individual little pads for the TQFP. Total bummer. I even tried brass. <laughs> I effectively went to McMaster Car, found every sheet stock they had that was like a reasonable thickness for a solder paste stencil and bought one of everything. <laughs> this is actually pretty thick brass and it cut really, really beautifully, but it's very thick and it's still, it's very hard to keep it flat but it did cut really, really nicely. I kind of want to just cut some cool brass stuff with the laser at some point in the future. Maybe I should still try this and explore this a little more, but it's also very expensive. The best that I ended up getting with a metal was bronze. So I cut this bronze sheet very low and slow and it still warped a ton. It was super warpy, but then what I decided to do is take my hot plate, crank it up super, super hot, like as hot as I could get it to go, take a big block of steel, put it on top with a bunch of weight and just bake the heck out of it. I think I left it there for like three or four hours and then I let it cool down with the weight on top of it and when it came out it was much better it's not perfect but it's pretty good and I think I could conceivably get a stencil out of this but this is still a lot of time and this is also a pretty expensive piece of material it's still not quite what I want and if you look really close at some of these surfaces especially near where the TQFP is it's still kind of bumpy. There's still gonna be not really good paste deposition. It has to be flat. It has to just be beautifully flat. And then I started exploring papers and I did eventually get to a pretty good point where I was able to cut out halfway decent stencils. I'm still blowing out all the pads for the TQFP and it's flat and smooth and I can squeegee across it. I even tried printer paper with Kapton tape to give it a little bit more strength, you know, so it's not just burning away and there's something kind of heat resistant in there. And that kind of worked. Maybe there's still something to explore there, but it's still not perfect. I'm not happy with any of these solutions. The cardstock definitely was the best and like, I still did it. It worked. I used it. So it's, it's good enough. I've even thought about buying a Cricut and like cutting out a sheet of vinyl. So if any of y'all have any suggestions about good, clean ways to make a nice rock solid, high resolution stencil for solder paste and like I don't know, under an hour? Please let me know in the comments. I'm, I want to find a better solution to this. So, all in all, I had a similar take about this whole process in my last video about making PCBs with a fiber laser. This is an exceptionally powerful tool in a lot of circumstances, but it is never going to replace the board shop, ever. If you need quick, rapid prototyping PCBs, making them on a fiber laser, toss them over to the Lumen for population, 3D printed enclosure, that is like the trifecta powerhouse of rapid prototyping. Quickly fabricate your design, get it populated on the Lumen, put it in your enclosure, flash firmware on it, like those three things let you just manifest something in a number of hours. It's really cool. It's like, it's very, very cool. 20 minutes PCB is done, another 10 and the board's populated on the Lumen. I, that's crazy. <laughs> that's like actually insane. Oh man, how cool. Anyway, that's it for this one. If you want more videos like this, don't forget to subscribe or I'm gonna be making more videos about R&D for Opulo hardware and any other interesting manufacturing stuff that we dive into. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. I couldn't pour water out of a boot with instructions on the heel. Instructions on the heel. Instructions on the heel. Okay. What was I saying? <laughs> laser, 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 laser. How's it going, Josh? Pretty good. I got a whole cart loaded up for you. I'll bring it down in like 30 seconds. Sounds good. See you soon, man. Bye-bye.